All right, everyone, welcome to our sermon time. I'm glad to have everybody here tonight. We're going to continue with our series on dumb ways to die. This time we're going to do number nine. And it's 42 youths dying as delinquents. Now, this is a very unusual story in the scripture and one that you may not be as familiar with, but we'll go on to it in just a moment. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, we read this account. Then he went up from there to Bethel, and as he was going up, by the way, young lads came from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. When he looked behind him and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up the 42 lads of their number. Now, I uh, I uh, <clears throat> forgot to look back up and make sure that I understood. But I think it's uh, Elisha that's being discussed here. Uh, someone can let me know if it's Elijah or, or the other one, but I think it's Elisha. Uh, and I, I intended to go back and look that up when I when I was putting the, the film, the uh, slides together for this time. But anyway, uh, I wanted you to see that this story is being so unusual as it is, uh, is it becomes really, really prominent fodder for atheists on the Internet, especially. And that's where I find their writings is on the Internet. Uh, atheists who believe that that uh, this is a prime example of why we should not ever believe in the scripture. Such as this guy uh, who says, I feel sorry for you that you have to use the Bible. And he puts a lowercase, lowercase B on Bible and a psychopathic, narcissistic, murdering God, lowercase d on God, as your moral compass in life instead of using your own brain. Now, obviously, uh, if you if you believe a story where God would cause 22 little kids to get torn up uh, by bears and, and would cause that to happen, then you can't believe in that God because it would be a narcissistic, murdering God and shouldn't be your moral compass instead of just using your brain. Now, that's the atheistic viewpoint. Another one, uh, an internet Bible critic says, no sane person would attempt to justify the homicide of 42 people of any age or gender simply for slinging verbal insults. Their behavior warranted a stern lecture and some lashes, not death by the hand of God. So people will instantly, uh, if, they, if they are against the idea of the Bible being the, the truth, and if they're against the idea of there being an almighty God, uh, they, will, they will do what I'm calling drive-by theology. They'll, they'll give knee-jerk reactions to unusual Bible accounts such as this one. And they'll remove text from their immediate context to make scathing judgments against God. They don't have any desire to understand. They just want to judge. So as we, as we think about this for a little bit, uh, let's realize that not everything that, that we find in the Bible is easy to understand. Sometimes we have to dig a little bit. Sometimes we have to work for it a little bit to really understand what the Bible is saying. And I think that's something that will happen with this story. I have to spend a little bit of time understanding why uh, God would cause the death of 42 youths um, and, and why uh, these two bears were called by God out from the woods to, to kill off these kids, these young people. We, we need to look at some, some issues here and, and use some plausible approaches to the issues and look at some ideas. Uh, the King James Version, for example, one of the early translations, many of the early translations will use the idea that these were little kids. So the question becomes, did God slay 42 little kids for sassing the prophet? That's really the, the lesson that we want to learn tonight is that there's, there's more to this than meets the eye. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of word study tonight on the word katan, which is a, a uh, the, the Hebrew word that's used here for le little or lesser. Uh, and, and the word basically means little or lesser. So when the uh, when the King James Version says little children, uh, they're, they're choosing one of the ideas of the word katan, but I think another idea is, is more likely. Uh, the, the word that is used for katan, the word katan that's used here, it has many different meanings to it. And, and basically it has to do with that, which is the smaller of, of, of a, a set of things. For example, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 16, you'll read, God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. So even though the moon is the lesser light, it's not, it's not that the sun is so much greater in size or whatever than the moon, even though it probably is. Uh, but, but the idea is the light put off from that from the, from the sun is greater than the light put off by the moon. So the moon is reflecting the sun and not the other way around. So it is the lesser light, it is the Catan light and not the greater light. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 24, when Noah is drunk in his tent and he's, uh, he is beset upon by his son, his youngest son, uh, he awoke from his wine and he knew that his, what his youngest son had done for him. So where katan is the word that is translated as youngest in that particular case. So it's not just little kids or the idea of young uh, youth, but it's the idea of him being younger than the other brothers. Genesis 19 and verse 11 is another idea. Uh, they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great. So they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. Now, this is from the from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, as the men who were trying to force the angels to have sex with them uh, were trying to get into the house. Um, God struck them, or the, the, the angels struck the men with blindness. 
And they struck them both the Catan and the great, the smaller, the lesser men and the greater men, not younger and older, but, but lesser as far as their, as their uh, status in life or whatever. And then the greater who were also those who were in power or whatever. So they weird themselves trying to find the doorway. So we have this idea that the word Catan means a lot more than just older or younger. It has more to do with station in life or, or position. Uh, if you uh, if you look at the Second Kings chapter two verse twenty three, uh, oh I'm sorry there there you go um, I, I was right it was Elisha I proved myself here. <laughs> if you look at the International Standard Version, which is one of the other translations, I think they take the great idea here and use the right idea of the of the word Catan. Uh, they quote it this way: Later Elisha left there and to go up to Bethel, and as he was traveling along the road, some insignificant young men came from the city and started mocking him. So they use the word Catan to mean insignificant. They're lesser men. They're lesser, they're lesser in the state and the status as far as the folks of Bethel were concerned. They were insignificant young men, or probably in this particular case, uh, they, were, they were just um, uh, delinquent young men. They told him, go up, go on up, Baldy, go on up, Baldy. Uh, so that's, that's the, the, the curse. Now, we're going to ask the question, does it, does it matter what they were, what they were how, how old they were, or whether they were young men, or, or whether they were, uh, uh, whether they were uh, lesser men, or whatever the idea is there. Does it matter if, if God will destroy them for, for just saying these two things, go up, go on up, Bali, go on up, Bali. Um, we're going we're gonna to look at it a little bit more at, at different word studies as we continue this lesson. Right now, let's look at the word for youth, which is the Hebrew word na'ar, na'ar. Uh, and, and we'll see that youth is not always young children either. Uh, so we have, the, we have the idea of the lesser men and then the, the children or the youth. Uh, let's see what youth means. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 24 uh, as, as Abraham is returning from the attack of the kings, uh, he says, I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eskol, and Mamre, let them take their share. Now, the young men are not little kids. Uh, Abraham's not going to take little kids into battle uh, on behalf of, of himself or his, his nephew Lot. Instead, he's going to take some young men. So these are young men, and the word Na'ar is used there instead of that. So these are Katan Na'ar. These are the lesser men, a lesser youth, uh, young men, but not necessarily little kids. Joshua 6 and verse 23. So the young men who were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all she had. They also brought out her, her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. So again, these are not little kids. Uh, they didn't send little kids into, into, uh, the, into Canaan to, to search it out. They sent young men. So the young men who were the spies went and they brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and so on and all she had. You can't see little children going in and saying, hey, Rahab, come on, let's go on over to the camp. No, these are young men. They're, they're, of, they're of battle age. They're old enough to be warriors, but they're young as compared to the older men and the wiser men in the, in the camp. These are all some very important elements in the story, and, and there's even a more important element that we need to look at, and that's what Bethel was at the, at the time that, that Elisha is going through Bethel. Bethel was a center for pagan idolatry in, in Israel. Right? Uh, the idea of going up, that they say, go up, Baldy, go up, Baldy, is probably a reference to the ascension of Elijah. Um, as, as Elijah was taken up into heaven by, by the means of the, of the whirlwind of God and the, and the uh, fiery chariot separated him from Elisha, uh, that became a very well-known uh, event in, in the city, uh, in the areas of, of, uh, of Israel. And so here is these folks at Bethel, these young men remembering what happened to Elisha, Elijah. They're saying to Elisha, why don't you go on up too? You go on up and get out of here. Uh, be taken up into heaven, just get lost, right? Especially what they're saying. Essentially, they're saying, do what your master did and get out of here. Now, the idea of them calling him baldy is, is basically a highly offensive verbal attack. Now, I know that today bald is beautiful, folks. Uh, we, we like bald folks. We like folks to shave their heads. Uh, some folks, I would look terrible with a shaved head. I've got such a lumpy head, it'd look awful, I think. But anyway, some folks don't have a problem with being uh, bald. But, but at the time that, that Elisha was on the earth, and as, as this story is being re, re, uh, reported, to be bald was to have an, an issue and to be diseased or something along that line. Uh, there were not very many, I suppose, bald folks because uh, everybody took good care of their hair, I suppose. But anyway, um, here's some Bible thoughts on baldness. Uh, look at Isaiah chapter 3, verse 17 and verse 24, uh, where, where God threatens the, the nation of Israel because of their, because of their uh, idolatry and their adultery against God. Uh, he says, therefore, the Lord will afflict the scalp of the daughters of Zion with scabs. The Lord will make their foreheads bare. That uh, will come about, verse 24, that instead of sweet perfume, there will be putrefaction. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, a plucked-out scalp. To have a plucked-out scalp was to be deemed uh, un unfit before God, to be, to be uh, 
uh, to be impure and to be uh, to be a, a delinquent themselves. So basically, what these youth are saying about uh, about Elisha is, uh, you're an unfit prophet, and you and you need to be removed by God, taken back up to heaven. Now that's it's hard for us to to understand with just this this little phrase that says, oh, "Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head." But when you understand what was being said, they were really being a very disrespectful group of folks against God's uh, person, God's person in the, in the form of the prophet. So, so then you, you read that, that uh, Elisha, Elisha brings down a curse on them uh, or he curses them. Now, now the word, the word that's used for curse there doesn't mean that he does some kind of mumbo jumbo and he, and he does some kind of magic spell and, and, and brings a curse and, and causes the bears to come out. The curse is an antithesis to blessing. Uh, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 to 28, for example, using the same word there, it says, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, and then later on in verse 28, the curse, if you do not listen to the commandments, all right? So you get a blessing if you listen to the commandments of God and you do what those commandments say. You receive the curse if you don't. So the curse is the antithesis to the blessing and not a, not a, a, uh, a means of bringing about harm or, or damage to the person. Uh, as you look at that that way, then what basically happens is uh, Elisha says to them, uh, "I'm going to I'm going to remove from you the blessing that I would ordinarily give you." Uh, and and beyond that, uh, we see other curses in in the old scripture where in the Old Testament when people say stuff like, "May this happen to you and more if if you prove to be un, un, unsound or whatever," or, or they'll say something like, um, uh, "May the Lord judge between you and me if ever you cross this stone or whatever." Uh, so there, there's those times when those types of curses are handed about. Which basically says, may God bring back terrible things against you if you don't repent of what you're doing or if you cause pain or harm for my family or whatever. So we see, uh, we see the idea that these two bears come out. And, and then the next question we have to ask is, who sent the bears? I don't think we have any reason to believe that Elisha either called for or had the power to summon the bears. Uh, that would be a, a miraculous event in any, in any case. And if he did so, I think the Bible would say then, then a miracle happened and Elisha was able to call two bears and they tore up the youth. All right. So God apparently saw a reason to send the bears to all these group of young men. And if you decide that God is a murderous uh, fool because of that, then you have to know that God is, is wiser than we are. Um, and so those who, who, will dis, who will show disdain for God do so because they don't understand the, the, the pure justice that God will send in the earth. They don't understand the idea that God's wisdom is greater than our own wisdom. And so they will, they will uh, denigrate God as just a narcissistic murdering uh, um, beast, basically. But God had a reason to bring these bears. He, he saw what was going on. Uh, he saw the, the depth of the, of the abuse that was going on in Bethel. He saw that these young men are going to eventually grow up to be older men and, and take over the, the leadership of the, of, the, uh, of the city of Bethel. So he takes this opportunity to thin out the, 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 uh, the bad seed just a little bit, I suppose. See, we have to understand that our God is a God of righteousness. He's not going to do something that's unrighteous, even though uh, even if it was just because uh, these these people were saying bad things about Elisha. Uh, I'm sure that Elisha had broad shoulders. He could have taken the bad things. He could have been cursed. But in this particular case, as, as they're saying the things they're saying about Elisha, they're also making fun of God. And God probably had been fed up with the, with the, uh, the idolatry of Bethel as it was. And so as Elisha is now shunted aside and, and refused to let him uh, do what he's doing in Bethel, uh, God sees a reason to remove them from the, from the scene. Uh, if you look at Psalm chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. If you're going to be wicked, you deserve to perish, all right? It's not that God chose these 42 young men and, and said, well, I'm just going to make an example of them. No, if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to stand against God, you have the, the expectation that you're going to be destroyed. And anyone who's not destroyed are not destroyed because of the, of the grace of God, not the other way around. So as we look at this story, it becomes a, a, a means for us to understand that God is a righteous God at all times. He's a just God at all times, and wicked folks deserve to die. Uh, every one of us deserves to die because every one of us has been wicked at one point in time. Uh, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all deserve to be put to death. If we're not put to death, it's because God is a gracious God, not because he's a narcissistic or a harsh or a, or a bloody murder type of a, of a God. All right. So as we continue to look at the righteousness of God, look at Psalm 9 and verse 8. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with, e with equity. Uh, God doesn't just choose out these 42 youth and say, you deserve to die, but nobody else deserves to die. No, God will rather look at the, at the world and say, these folks are going to die because I've got to make a point here. But, but they, the other folks are going to live because I'm going to be gracious to them. Uh, God can be gracious on who he chooses to be gracious to. 
if you're going to sin against God, if you're going to, if you're going to sin against God's prophet, then, then you deserve to die. And if God chooses to take your life at that period of time, that's God's right to do so. If you look at Psalm 19, verse nine, the judgments of the Lord are true. They're righteous altogether. See, we, we have a problem, I think, with the righteousness of God, because the righteousness of God is always right. It's always right. Now, we are not always right, and our righteousness sometimes ends up to be unrighteous, but, but that's because we're, we're less than informed, uh, we're much less informed than God is. Rather, we need to see that God is always right. He always makes the proper judgments. And so in this particular case, the judgments of the Lord are true. As God chose to take the, the life of those 42 youth, he did so for, for a purpose that only God knows, probably. Uh, but he did so, and he was righteous in doing so, because the judgments of the Lord are always true, and they're always righteous together. So as we look at these things, let's look at Proverbs 18 and verse 5. To show partiality to the wicked is not good, nor to thrust aside the righteous in judgment. Uh, it's actually an evil thing to suggest that, that God should have spared the life of those youth, because if you show partiality to the wicked and don't put them to death when they deserve to be put to death, uh, then, then that's, that's not good. Uh, nor do you thrust aside the righteous in judgment. Uh, it's not good to, to say, uh, I'm going to show these youth uh, the, the mercy of God, but then a righteous person is going to be shunned, shunned aside by God and not given, given special attention. Uh, that would be wrong as well. So we see it's very important for us to understand that, that God is right when he, when he punishes his wickedness. He's always right, and he should punish every one of us to death for the sins that we've committed against him, but he chooses to be righteous and good. He chooses also to be gracious and merciful to us, and so we should thank God for that rather than, than blaming him when he does cause us the death of, of someone who's wicked. It's God's view versus our view, basically, is what we come down to. Uh, we have to understand that our view is always limited by our own sight, and God's view is not limited by anything. Uh, God's view is always the right view because he has the highest view. He has the, the understanding view. He has the view that is, that is always going to be pure and, and holy and righteous. Our views may be wrong, and if, we, if they are, we need to admit when we realize that we're wrong. But our views may be off, and if our views are off, it's because we are limited in our scope. Look at John chapter 7, verse 24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Uh, sometimes I think we judge because we think something looks wrong, but we don't always know all the facts. In this particular case, God knows all the facts. He knows what these youth are doing. He knows what Elisha is doing. He knows who, who he wants to support, and he knows, why, he knows why they need to be supported. He also knows why he's bringing about the judgment against those youth. We just don't always know. So if we're going to judge God, we have to judge God by God's own righteousness, but we can't understand that totally. So we have to realize that God is above us and his ideas are above our ideas. So we do the best we can with what we have. Uh, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. The only righteous judgment we can have is to say that we know that God is righteous. We have to have faith and trust that God is righteous. And if he does something, we, we can search for the ideas that we can find. Sometimes we might not always know what he's doing or why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, but in this particular case, I think he was supporting his, his prophet in a place where folks were disrespecting the, both the prophecies of God and God himself, and were, were falling to the, to the, uh, to the wayside with the, with the false gods and the false views that they were holding. If you look at Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Now God says to, uh, to Israel through Hosea, uh, you're being destroyed for lack of knowledge. Uh, God was choosing us to bring their death about because they were not knowledgeable people. They were leaving the knowledge of God and they were taking instead the, the knowledge of the false gods. And they were, they were corrupting God's word and corrupting God's, God's uh, uh, holiness by, by becoming uh, basically a, a group of, of sexually, uh, sexually overactive and, and uh, uh, false God worshiping folks that, that were out of control. So God says, uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I will also reject you from being my priest. Uh, since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also have forgotten your children. Uh, God, is, God is not afraid to destroy folks because of their uh, inability or, uh, or unwillingness to, to understand him or, or do what he wants them to do. Uh, wants them to do. And so he will, he will eventually uh, bring about the death of everyone who is, who is against him and who is his enemy. Uh, the, the, these youth died a cruel death or a very sudden death and an unexpected death is not an indictment against God. It's still an indictment against them. So brethren, that's our lesson for tonight. If, if we're gonna if we're gonna judge God, we have to judge God based upon His own righteousness. We can't judge God based upon our thinking or our feelings or our our, uh, our emotional uh, our emotionally challenged ideas. Sometimes we can't judge God according to those things. We have to judge God by Himself, and we can't judge God at all because God is the judge. So for us to decide that that God is out of control because He brings about the death of forty two youth who were disrespecting His prophet, is for us to decide that we know better what justice is than God knows. Uh, I'm, I'm never going to take that step myself. I believe that God was right in what he did. I believe he's always right when he brings about the death of people on the earth. 
Uh, I believe that every one of us is only blessed to be alive because God has blessed us to do so. Uh, I deserve to die and you do too, because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but he's given us a great gift instead through Jesus Christ, his son. God chose to bring about the death of his own son. If God chose to bring about the death of his own son, uh, he's still a righteous God, even though he brought about the death of someone who's perfectly uh, sinless and dear to him because he did so, so that we could be saved. Uh, I'm, I'm always going to stand on God's side because I know that God is right. And I know that God is righteous and I know that he's loving and I know he loves us because he gave his only begotten son to save us. So if you have a problem with God's righteousness, then, then you've got to ch check your own righteousness and figure out why you have a problem with it. God's righteous because he's always right. And he's always good. We're, we're sinful because we're always sinning. Uh, if, if God spares us, he does so through his, through his own mercy and his own grace. We should rejoice in that. Um, I'm rejoicing tonight because we are saved, because we have the opportunity to come to God through Jesus Christ. If you haven't done so yet, then I pray that you'll make that right tonight with God, that you'll come to be a part of his family by being baptized through through uh, the blood of Jesus, be brought into the, to, uh, accord with God again, and that you would stand, stand whole before God as a person who's been saved from your sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. You do that through baptism. We're ready to help you with that if you come tonight. Uh, let us know through the through the chat if you're ready, or, or let us know through our webpage or any way that you can find it. Contact us. Please contact us. Let us know that you want to be saved. Uh, we are rejoicing this week because we have two new si a new brother and a new sister in Christ who have responded to these messages. Uh, we're glad that they have responded to the gospel as well. Uh, if there's anything else we can do for you, anyway, we can help you or serve you. Let us know that as we as we sing the song that's been selected. <laughs> 